thank you for uh, giving this opportunity to present our work. Any work that we present is always done by the students and postdocs of the lab. And this is my current lab, which has uh, almost around 10 people. Uh, but the funding is from uh, code as well as Department of Biotechnology. So, Martin tuberculosis as a pathogen is well known and it is mentioned one. It claims approximately 1.5 million lives per year, and even today. So, in the emergence of uh, multi drug resistance and exclusively drug resistant tuberculosis poses immense threats for the control of this particular disease. So, India also has the highest poor demand. So, no, the Mycobacterium tuberculosis, as an infection goes, is uh, when we are exposed to somebody who's infected, who's coughing, that actually, uh, that actually we end up getting it, and that bug is then taken up by the innate immune system, which, uh, uh, which then actually the, the advantage of like basically is surrounded by multiple immune cells, which is uh, surrounded by multiple immune cells uh, and contained. This particular stage is called granuloma. This granuloma in your body has three different fates. One fate is it completely gets eliminated, in which case it's called calcified granuloma. The second stage is it actually develops into an active disease, which happens in about 5 to 10 percent cases. And the third one is basically where kind of a tug of war, but it is nobody realistically has one. Your bacteria is still there and it's called latent infection. When the opportunity is appropriate, this latent infection can convert into an active infection. So for the last 16 years, we have been working on various aspects of this pathogen. One of the major interest has been serine-3-N protein kinases in mycobacterium tuberculosis. And we have been worked on the cell wall peptidoglycan synthesis. We have worked on the cell division. We worked on the transcription factor and even worked on the post mediated mechanisms, which would allow us to develop something called post-directed therapy and on the DNA repair and base excision treatment pathways. So for today's talk, I would focus only on the transcription factor angle, none of the other things, so that the talk would be more focused. So the work is completely done by, uh, almost 90% of the work is done by this talented girl named Mac and supported uh, by another gra graduate student in the club. And it is, uh, it is done in collaboration with Gauri and his student, uh, Gauri Nath and his student. So there are approximately 200 transcription factors that are present in mycobacterium tuberculosis. So these transcription factors include what you call a sigma factor and uh, and a lot of other factors which are there. So what we did is we went in and mined the transcription factor database and found that when I say in vitro, it is about the bacteria growing in the uh, in, in the culture, when we say in vivo, it is about going inside uh, in, inside the uh, host, such as mice. So there are approximately ten transcription factors that are not essential for growth outside, but are essential for growth in the host. And out of which only one was found to be specific to actinomycetes, which is a particular uh, kind of a group of organisms, and which is MTB is part of that. So we went ahead and started characterizing this particular transcription factor. This transcription factor is part of an 11 genopron, and it is a uh, 24 kilodalton cytosolic transcription factor. I mean, other things I've already said, it in vitro non-essential, ex vivo, and in vivo it be essential. Ex vivo is a cell line infection model. So what is this transcription factor? It's a very small transcription factor. It had two cysteine residues in the internal region. And nobody had characterized in any of the 51 bacteria in which it was present. And we purified it. We found it to be a dimer. We raised antibodies. These are the tools that are not needed. And we found that it is present uniquely, exclusively present in actinomycetes. These are the organisms where it is present. So how does one actually characterize anything in any kind of a bacteria? One of the things is to generate tools, to creating an anti I mean, a knockoff. That is precisely what we have done. You can actually generate knockout if it is a non-essential gene, which this one is. So what you, we have done is that we basically replaced the uh, transcription factor with an antibiotic hydromycin. You very clearly see that. And after that, we select the colonies on hydromycin. Uh, it's easier said than, than MTB because one, the mycobacterium tuberculosis as a pathogen Unlike E. coli, which gives a colony in one day, mycobacterium tuberculosis gives a colony in 20 days. And so 
you get contaminations and its homologous combination efficiency is poor. In any case, we have generated a knockout and then we have also generated a complementation clone where you express the same gene which you have knocked out under its own promotion. And you can very clearly see that our knockout is the second lane is very clearly the protein is not present and when we complement it, it comes back. This is a tool. And then when we went ahead and did growth curves with this bacilli, and what you see is that we did not see any difference whatsoever in the growth of this particular mutant compared with the wild type or with the complemented strain, both in limiting media as well as the full-grown media. These were all done in culture flasks. However, when we started doing the experiment with cell lines, you can very clearly see the, the, that in the first part, that uh, uh, in the cell lines, in about 96 hours, we get a compromised growth, approximately log fold difference. Mind you, this is a log scale. And we have done the same experiment in a mice infection model. What you do in this is that you take the mice and you aerosolically infect either with the wild type or the mutant or the complemented strain. And after that, you uh, sacrifice the mice under different, different days and look into the bacillary load in their lungs. You can very clearly see as by day 14 itself it starts that the mutants seem to have much lower survival on day 42, 70 and even 112 compared to the wild type or the complemented strains. But the, how much lower? It is approximately 10 to 50 fold lower depending on the time point. So the question is, if this transcription factor is essential for survival inside a host, why is it not essential for the bacteria in, in the context of an uh, in vitro growth? So obviously it is to do with something to do with the stress that is imposed by the host. What kind of stresses does one face when you go into the host? You have oxidative stress, nitrosative stress, phagosomal acidification, nutritional stress, and damage to surface structures. What we can do is subject the pathogen to these stresses one by one independently and see what happens to the survival, which is what we have done. We put acidic stress, nothing happened. Starvation, nothing happened. SDS stress, nothing happened. And uh, data NO, which is nitrosative stress, nothing happened. But interestingly, when we put an oxidative stress, sometimes it is very slow, it's getting slow. okay. When we put an oxidative stress, we saw approximately one and a half log fold difference. So after doing this, we went ahead and did it with many other oxidizing agents. Let me tell you that it works the same way. Anytime you put an oxidative stress, the mutant shows compromised survival compared to the white type and the complementary strain. So what is this particular protein has? The protein is approximately uh, whatever it is. It has an N-terminal region. We found it has two cysteine residues and in about 20 amino acids. So what we did is we wanted to study the importance of this N-terminal region, which was specifically found in the pathogenic bacterial tuberculosis, but not in others. So we deleted it and we did the complementation experiments with either the wild type or with the mutant. What we get is that while the wild type could beautifully complement, the mutant of the N-terminal region failed to do so. And when we took another um, uh, transcription factor which has no N-terminal region, that is a magmatis transcription factor, even that did not complement. So we thought it may be because the cysteine residues play an important role in oxidative stress. So maybe if we mutate the cysteines, what happens? So we basically mutated the cysteine residues, and when we mutated the cysteine residues, we did not get any complementation. So we have done further studies to show that these cysteines actually form intracellular, uh, intramolecular disulfide bonds, and these are extremely important for its function. The question is, what is it doing? How is it doing this particular thing? So. What one does is basically does something called, um, uh, nowadays everybody does, this uh, transcriptome analysis, which is we have done RNA-seq to find out what are the downstream targets of the AOSR. We did we do it, wild type and the mutant, in the regular condition and in the oxidative condition. To cut the story a little bit short, in the normal condition, we did not find any major differences between the wild type and the mutant. However, when we subjected the cells to we found approximately 326 genes are upregulated in the uh, in the mutant and 108 are downregulated. Or it's uh, the, the other way around. Actually, these are downregulated and there are, uh, that many are upregulated. So 
this basically meant that the class action factor has a specific role in the oxidative stress and in the absence of the oxidative stress so i mean in the, in the absence of uh, the transcription factor we would have down regulation of multiple genes which are required for survival in the oxidative stress to prove if it is the case we actually did took 10 top candidates and did the nine top candidates and did the analysis what we did is we made the rna from regular and in uh, oxidative conditions and looked into what happens to their expression so you can see that all the candidates which were showing upregulation in the uh, upon oxidative stress are upregulated and two candidates we picked which were showing down regulation are down regulated if they are dependent on the transcription factor the mutant it should do it should show a very uh, i mean uh, a, a different scenario that is what happens in the mutant that upregulation that you see up straight up is completely lost and the down regulation that you see is also lost so transcription factor is doing this how that is the question. So when we looked into the this particular candidate, we found that there is one which is part of the same opon in which transcription factor is actually expressed. And these uh, are belong to something called cysteine metabolism. I'll come to this a little bit, I think, sort of this. So the opron actually has uh, 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 the transcription factor and the three genes called maxisocysin. This maxisocysin are basically involved in cysteine biosynthesis, especially the alternate cysteine biosynthesis. You can see that cysteine in, uh, in uh, bacteria, especially in tuberculosis, is normally made from canonical pathway where this serine is converted to cysteine eventually. But in addition to that, there are two non-canonical pathways. One of them is mediated by these three genes that are present in the same opon, and that is cis and MAC, where it is made from O-phosphoserine. Uh, the so our initial hypothesis was that the transcription factor is regulating its own transcription as well as that of the downstream genes. But unfortunately, when we did the, uh, we proved this hypothesis by providing cysteine alone, are overexpressing all the three genes that are present in the opron. In both cases, we get complementation, suggesting that these three genes expression is indeed regulated by the transcription factor. However, when we did analysis, we found that there is no binding in our electromagnetic mobility ship assays and there was no difference in the uh, uh, there was no difference in the expression profile of the transcription factors you can see that in the sds in the, in the western block however when we actually did a real time pcr for the whole of plant we see that the first three genes are not getting upregulated but the remaining genes are getting upregulated when we add oxidative stress, indicating that something else is happening. So what is that happening? Yes, transcription factor is important. Transcription factor is regulating, but it's not auto-regulating its own promoter, but it's regulating most probably something else. How is that doing? So we came up with an alternate hypothesis where we thought that the transcription factor binds to an alternate promoter, which is normally not active, but becomes active only upon stress. And to prove this, what we did is we took this alternate promoter and we performed uh, report assays. So without any reporter, without uh, any promoter, with sigma A promoter positive control and the alternate promoter in front of a loser You can very clearly see that sigma A promoter, this is without oxidative stress and the next one is without oxidative stress. In case of sigma A promoter, there is a, if at all, the slight decrease upon oxidative stress and in case of the the promoter that we have thought, alternate promoter, is clearly induced, and this induction is approximately 100 fold upon oxidative stress. And it is dependent on the transcription factor in the mutant, it is not induced. So, this tells you that there is an alternate promoter, and it is because of this alternate promoter that we are getting an induction of the rest of the genes. So, that part is done. So, we understood the mechanism. So, one of the things is, is it really post induced? Is it Required for host induced oxidative stress. In the host, that is in mice or in ours, the phagosomes have two different ways to increase the stress, oxidative stress. One of them is called phagocytic oxidase, which increases the reactive oxygen species. The other one is nitric oxide, which indirectly influences, which is actually an anthracitic stress, but indirectly influences the oxidative levels in the, uh, in the cell. So, to test this out, if this transcription factor is indeed responsible or plays a role in this, we have used various mutants of mice. Fox, knockout is basically Fox's phagocytic oxidase. 
IFN actually feeds into both the pathways. So we did this work and inhibitors of INOX. You can see very clearly that in the normal condition, there is a very clear difference in the mutant. But when you actually use phagocytic oxidase mutant, that difference is going down, but not completely recovered. Nitric oxide inhibitor going down, not completely recovered. But a combination completely eliminates survival problems the mutant has. Same thing we have shown using an IA interferon gamma mutant, which is actually responsible for subjecting the cell to an oxidative stress. So, so what it basically says this transcription factor seems to be playing a critical role through the cysteine biosynthesis in protecting the mycobacterium tuberculosis from post induced oxidative stress. We have actually wanted went ahead and I didn't wanted to identify how is this doing. Towards doing this, we basically found out what are the novel interacting partners of this transcription factor. And one of the interesting proteins that we found was a protein named Sigma H, which is a alternate Sigma factor. And this was validated by Western blots. And we find that, that Sigma H indeed interacts with all these, uh, uh, in, 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 indeed interacts in oxidative conditions only and very specifically. So finally, we've done the same experiment with Sigma H knockout. And in the Sigma H knockout, the induction that we see in the protein, uh, in the in the operonic genes is gone. So indicating that basically based on all these things, these are the negative controls that we have done. Based on all these things, we basically believe the following. Under normal conditions, this particular operon, this is they, they express at a basal level, which contribute to some level of l cysteine biosynthesis through this particular non-canonical pathway. In addition to that, cis K1 and cis K2, I'm done, sir. last slide. So cis K1 and cis K2 actually all feed into the cysteines. And this is important for maintaining the uh, homeostasis. But in, the, in, in oxidative stress, the sigma H becomes free and it interacts with AOSR through the disulfide bond from the AOSR. And this interacts with an alternate promoter, increasing the uh, cysteine biosynthesis through three, these three genes. And this is increased cysteine is important for directly modulating multiple metabolites. And also these metabolites most probably feed into genome-wide transcription rewiring. Some of these things, details have not been shown, but we have done the experiments. So we have actually identified a novel transcription factor, which has not never been characterized prior to this and show that it interacts with an alternate sigma factor and regulates metabolite cysteine levels in the cell. And that is important for the survival of the pathogen. If we can target either the alternate cysteine biosynthesis pathway or the transcription factor per se indirectly, uh, or in addition to the existing drugs, we should have relatively lesser survival. We have preliminary data that suggests that this may be important for establishment of the latency. We are not done any further experiment. We are exploring these options. All these experiments, as I said, was done by one graduate student and an excellent work. So we are, it's not yet been, uh, this is just under communication. So we're not published. So I wanted to share one of these things. Thank you very much.